This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Yort. It's Monday, April 5th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. Ethiopia says Eritrean troops have started withdrawing from Tigray. The announcement in a statement by the Ethiopian Foreign Ministry follows mounting reports blaming the Eritreans for human rights abuses, including rape, looting, and killings of civilians. Yahaira Jackies of Reuters reports. The Ethiopian Foreign Ministry said Eritrean forces have started withdrawing from the Tigray region in northern Ethiopia, following mounting reports blaming the Eritreans for human rights abuses, including rape, looting, and killings of civilians. The United States, Germany, France, and other G7 countries this week called for a swift and verifiable withdrawal of the Eritrean troops followed by a political process acceptable to all Ethiopians. For months, Eritrea and Ethiopia denied the presence of Eritrean troops despite dozens of eyewitness accounts. <laughs> Just last month, Ethiopia's Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, acknowledged their presence, while Eritrea has still not said its soldiers are there. Ethiopia sent its troops to Tigray in November to fight against the TPLF then the regional ruling party, which had attacked army bases in the region. In late November, the TPLF withdrew and the Ethiopian government declared victory. Electricity and phone connections to Tigray have been down for the past four days, making it difficult to verify any Eritrean withdrawal. Thousands of people have been killed in the conflict, hundreds of thousands have been forced from their homes, and there are shortages of food, water and medicine in the region. That report by Yahaira Jackies of Reuters, an Egyptian museum which now houses a collection of ancient Egyptian mummies officially opened its doors to the public on Sunday with the mummies due to go on display later this month. The Egyptian Museum of National Civilization was originally founded to document the history of civilization, including the Stone Age, ancient Egypt and the Coptic Age. After being closed for several years while undergoing renovation, it received its official inauguration on Saturday when a convoy transported the mummies of 18 kings and four queens from the Egyptian Museum in central Cairo's Tahrir Square. Pustat, their home in the new museum, was the site of Egypt's capital under the Arab conquest. The museum houses a collection of items from various time periods throughout Egypt's history from prehistoric to the modern era, according to Museum Lab Director Abdelazim Abderazek. A new study published in the Lancet Medical Journal finds that stillbirths, maternal deaths, and ectopic pregnancies rose during the coronavirus pandemic, possibly because women had reduced access to medical services. VOS Maria Madiello reports on the data covering 6 million pregnant women in nearly 20 countries. Little Malek was born at the beginning of March. His mother, Hind Shurgen, found out she was pregnant during the coronavirus pandemic. She was told to minimize trips to doctors or hospitals where services were stretched by the number of patients with the virus. Eventually, she fell sick and was diagnosed remotely with pneumonia. But after her illness, her doctor did an antigen test that confirmed she's had COVID-19. It's just a huge, you know, world that's really unknown. And it really pushed me over the edge. And, and I was so stressed out throughout the whole end of my pregnancy because of that. You know, what if, what if, what if. After several scans, Shurgen was assured her baby was developing normally. But she couldn't stop worrying. You're, you're kind of, you know, playing the lottery with this information. And I didn't get tested again for antigens. But I did carry out the fear with me and this worry and constant, constant, like, second-guessing everything I did. 
Professor Asma Khalil, an obstetrician at St. George's Hospital in London, is among a group of doctors studying the impact of the virus on women and their pregnancies. Uh, we included more than 6 million um, pregnant women uh, from 40 studies in, from 17 uh, countries. And we compared the pregnancy outcomes during the COVID-19 pandemic with the period before the pandemic. The report published in the Lancet Medical Journal found that the number of stillbirths and the number of women who died during pregnancy rose by nearly a third during the pandemic. The number of women who needed emergency care for ectopic pregnancies, where the fetus is growing outside of the womb, was six times higher in 2020 than the year before. Also in the report, a significant increase in the number of women suffering stress and anxiety. Halil says stillbirths and deaths are not a direct cause of infection from COVID-19, but from what she describes as collateral damage of the pandemic. Across the world, lockdowns prevented women from traveling to hospitals for checkups. Co-author of the Lancet report, Professor Shakila Tangaratnam from the University of Birmingham advises some caution over the data. If you look at stillbirths, the figures are uh, uh, a bit more, uh, but because of the rarity of the condition of stillbirths, the proportion itself is still quite low. We are talking about um, number of stillbirths around uh, 1,000 uh, in high-income settings, another 1,000 in, um, in a low-income uh, setting. And again, um, this is something that will need to be reviewed constantly. She says there is no doubt the pandemic has had an adverse influence on women's health but many more studies need to be done. How much it is, uh, how generalizable this is across uh, countries as well as across the income status. Um, what are the specific factors that contribute most? So these are information that we still need to continue to report and, um, and collect. Mariama Diallo, VOA News. Kenya's tourism sector is taking another hit after a fresh lockdown announced last week for Nairobi and four surrounding counties due to a record surge in coronavirus infections. Victoria Munga in Nairobi looks at Kenya's important tourism industry and how tour companies are struggling to survive. For Kenyan tour drivers like George Ocheng, the Easter holiday is normally one of their busiest times of the year but fresh restrictions on movement to stop a coronavirus surge has again forced cancellations and lost incomes. Today I was not supposed to be there because I was supposed to go to another, um, a two-day earlier. Then on the second, I go to another one. But the government being locking the Nairobi, the uh, Kajiado, the, Abosel, uh, the, the Nakuru, the Kiambu, we cannot go to Masai Mara, and Masai Mara is our main, main game reserve that sells Kenya as a whole. The Masai Mara and other national parks helped rank Kenya as the third largest tourism economy in sub-Saharan Africa in 2019 after South Africa and Nigeria. The tourism sector accounted for 9% of Kenya's gross domestic product until the pandemic and lockdowns last year grounded it to a halt. Relaxed domestic travel in July led to a slow recovery, but ongoing restrictions have cost Kenyans more than two million jobs. My last job was 15th February, and it's only a, a two-day safari in Masai Mara. And that's the last job I did on, uh, from January to March today. The new lockdown announced March 26th came after the average positive rate of people tested jumped from 2% in January to 22% in March. But while the new restrictions are expected to save lives, Kenya's tourism trade is quickly dying. For example, Mombasa. We had over six charters to Malindi, Mombasa, and uh, Okonda. All those people had to reschedule their travel. Most of them have rescheduled. But we have a percentage that uh, they want to cancel altogether. Bars and restaurants in the five counties can only provide takeaway and are not allowed to serve alcohol. The Hotel and Liquor Traders Association of Kenya says nearly 15,000 bars in the counties were forced to close. 
Kenya's hoteliers are among the worst hit by the restrictions. Instead of just a blanket ban, let's have a plan. Because we cannot continue that every time there is a spike, we lock down. Every time there is a spike, we lock down. We need to have a plan of how to mitigate against this disease. Kenyan authorities did not immediately announce any additional financial support for the tourism industry. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. A Swiss startup is looking to boost confidence in the safety of air travel amid the coronavirus pandemic by using decades old technology. VOA's Arasha Rabasadi shines light on this story. A virus killing robot roams the aisles of an airplane in Zurich. The robot must operate without a human to deliver its waves of ultraviolet light. Uvia co-founder Jodak Elmiser explains. It's quite an old technology, but it's quite dangerous. That's why we want to take the worker out of the range of the light. So that's why we made a robot. Excess exposure to ultraviolet or UV radiation can cause cancers in humans. But UVA's founders say the decades-old UVC technology delivered by the autonomous robot has the upside of killing the coronavirus. Elmager says using light to sanitize a plane is safer than cleaning solutions. UVC doesn't make any traces or uh, chemistry, so that's also very important for the traveler that you know that you have a safe place and there is no chemical residue on the, on the seats or no, everywhere. One robot can disinfect an entire single aisle airplane in 13 minutes. That's welcome news for Swiss regional airline Helvetic Airways, says spokesman Matthew Gurnan. As an airline, at the moment, it's really important that we can restore the confidence in air travel. So if our passengers, if our crew know our aircraft is safe, there is no viruses, no bacteries, it could help uh, to fly again and to have a good feeling to fly again. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration says UVC radiation is a known disinfectant for air, water and non-porous surfaces, but can be blocked by something as simple as dust. Uvia currently has three robot prototypes and recently demonstrated one of them at the Zurich airport where traffic dropped 75% last year. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. Coming up, Kenyan runner breaks women's half marathon record. Stay with us. Welcome back to Africa 54. The first week of the trial of Derek Chauvin, the white former police officer accused of murder and manslaughter in the death of George Floyd, an African-American man featured graphic video and dramatic testimony of Floyd's arrest. Chauvin's supervisors questioned the former officer's actions while Chauvin's lawyer tried to plant the seeds of reasonable doubt. Michael Sullivan reports. Graphic images from police body cameras, security systems, and bystanders, all filling in the timeline on May 25, 2020, as police struggled to get Floyd into a patrol vehicle. Derek Chauvin later pressed his knee into Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes. That was not standard practice, said a police official who was questioned by prosecutor Steve Schleicher. What level of force might that be? That would be the top tier, the deadly force. Why? Because of uh, the fact that um, if, if your knee is on a person's neck, that can kill him. Jurors also heard this week from bystanders, including an off-duty firefighter who had trained as an emergency medical technician. She struggled with emotion, saying she offered to help Floyd, but an officer refused to give her access. I thought his face looked puffy and swollen, um, which would happen if you are putting a grown man's weight on someone's neck. Chauvin's defense portrayed Floyd as a large man under the influence of drugs, creating an ongoing threat made worse by volatile bystanders. Police were responding to a report that Floyd had tried to buy cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. 
I um, saw the bill. I noticed that it had a blue pigment to it, kind of how a $100 bill will have, and I found that odd. But as events unfolded, the clerk said he experienced disbelief and guilt over Floyd's treatment. A police emergency dispatcher who was watching a video feed became concerned and notified a sergeant. Something might be wrong. Retired Sergeant David Ploger said that after Floyd was handcuffed on the ground and had stopped resisting, Chauvin should have stopped applying pressure to his neck. Defense attorney Eric Nelson has said Floyd's death was caused not by the officer, but by drugs and a heart problem, and that Chauvin was struggling to restrain Floyd under conditions that became increasingly tense. Paramedics said Floyd had no pulse as he lay on the ground. He was later placed in an ambulance where attempts to resuscitate him were unsuccessful. The trial resumes on Monday. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News. U.S. President Joe Biden recently announced a $2 trillion spending plan aimed at modernizing the nation's roads and bridges, among other infrastructure. The plan, however, is expected to face obstacles in Congress. VOA's Michelle Quinn reports. It's time to build our economy from the bottom up. President Biden's proposed infrastructure plan paints a broad picture of what counts as infrastructure. It's not just for fixing roads and bridges, but for building out broadband internet and technology to mitigate climate change. In my view, this is a once in a lifetime moment. I don't think in the next 50 years, we're gonna see another time when we have this combination of a demonstrated need, bipartisan interest, widespread impatience, and a very supportive president who is committed, by the way, not just to the infrastructure itself, but to the jobs we're gonna create. The package's jobs plan includes building the nation's clean energy workforce and boosting caregiving as a profession. Republican leaders say the proposal is too big. The package envisions a network of 500,000 electric car charging stations by 2030. When people think about air infrastructure, they're thinking about roads, bridges, ports, and airports. That's a very small part of what they're calling an infrastructure package. Paying for the bill is also an issue. The package proposes tax increases on corporations, which Republicans say they oppose. The bill is now being taken up by Congress, with Democratic leaders aiming to get it to the president's desk for a signature in the coming months. The package will be a test of the Democratic Party's unity. If Biden can't get support from any Republicans, he will need every Democrat to vote for it in the evenly divided Senate. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. The United States is becoming an increasingly diverse country, with whites expected to account for less than 50% of the population by 2045. There's a push to make books for children as diverse as the nation itself. Experts say the success level of future American adults could be at stake. Viewers Dora McQua reports. Many American children grow up reading books that don't contain characters who look like them. That was certainly the case for Krista Aronson. As an adult, I can see the ways in which having more um, representation of children like me might have made me feel more confident and comfortable in moving around the world, less like um, uh, an outsider. That's one of the reasons Aronson founded DiverseBookFinder.org. When children see themselves reflected in the literature that they read, it helps them understand that they are visible and valuable members of society, which can help instill feelings of positivity about their own identities. Diverse Book Finder helps librarians and the general public find inclusive titles for children. Jason Homer runs a library system in a racially diverse area of Massachusetts. He wants young readers to see themselves and healthy representations of other cultures whenever they pick up a book. We want books to be both the window and the mirror for people. So we want children to be able to see themselves in books and we want children to be able to see into other cultures. And so diversity is an essential part of building any library collection. Philip Nell directs the children's literature program at Kansas State University. Children all need to see themselves in the books they read. They need to know that their stories matter. They need to know that their lives matter. To have your voice, to have your story, 
to have your life and, and history not acknowledged is is a kind of spiritual erasure. It tells you you don't matter. The experts say a lack of diversity in children's books hurts all young readers and not just kids from marginalized groups. But it also damages majority kids' imaginations. It damages white kids' imaginations because it suggests to them that they are the center of the universe. It suggests to them that only their stories matter, you know, and, and, that, and that instills in them a, a false sense of superiority. Um, that can lead to racist ways of seeing too. As children grow up in an increasingly diverse world, being able to bridge any divides could be vital to their future accomplishments. And I really do see it as a muscle that has to be, that has to be worked and practiced. How do I interact with those who may be different um, from me? It's gonna be important to the success of our children and thus the success of our society. Which means picture books are more than just child's play. Dora McQuar, VOA News, Washington. Asians are a diverse group in the U.S., but they all share a similar response to possible hate crimes. Activists spoke to BOA's Virginia Gunawan for this report. Violent acts against Asian Americans have been on the rise across the United States. In cities like New York and Philadelphia, there have been hate crimes against Asian Americans. A local community leader in Philadelphia describes an incident against two Indonesian teens on the subway. They push the girls sitting on the bench and say, like, keep, uh, you know, move, move, move. And the girls from the other group just smack the Indonesian teen on the side of her head and, like, repeatedly. And then after that, the other one got also got punched and smacked until, like, her headphones fell off. So Philadelphia resident Sinta Penyami Storms has long been active in anti-racism movements from the Black Lives Matter movement of last summer to the Stop Asian Hate Movement now. There are just so many layers of hate in this country. I want us to peel them one by one and shed the light on them. She says one thing that hampers investigation into possible hate crimes against Asian Americans is the reluctance to report incidents. Typically, Asians are known to be that model minority. You know, in Indonesian, people probably will say like, oh, you know what, like, just don't get involved. Because, you know, like, you may be get hurt if you get involved. If we don't speak up, we don't get the data, and we don't get the resources coming to our community. Resources like funding, resources like a security, um, just coming for the police. Attacks against Asians are reportedly on the rise across the U.S., driven by rhetoric and misinformation blaming China for the coronavirus pandemic. The advocacy group Stop AAPI Hate cites almost 3,800 incidents ranging from racial slurs to physical attacks from March 2020 through February of this year. Data compiled by California State University's Center for the Study of Hate and Extremisms recorded 122 hate crimes in 2020, over twice the number in 2019. Activists say many factors could cause Asian Americans to underreport potential hate crimes. They may not have had good interactions um, with the, the local police or the government in the past and therefore do not trust that anything good's going to come out of it. And, and that's not an unfounded fear, right? Because of the stories about police misconduct too toward people of color in this country. Indonesian Americans account for less than 1% of the estimated 22 million Americans of Asian descent. While most have been spared the recent spate of anti-Asian incidents, Indonesian consulates and the Indonesian embassy have issued an alert to be extra vigilant when out in the public. From Washington, D.C., Virginia Gunawan, VOA News. Nine-year-old Naja Pivel from Boston, Massachusetts, has been drawing since she could hold a pencil. It's been especially important to her during the COVID lockdown, as Ginia Dulot reports from Boston. Nine-year-old Nadia Pivov loves drawing and comics. She takes what she sees around her and puts it on paper. This is her way of turning everything that surrounds her into characters and her own comic world. She adds humor and sarcasm, a little bit of irony, to what she sees, different situations, people, and I believe that's truly unique. 
The isolation of COVID made her turn to her comics as relief. Even her math workbook is full of fun drawings on the subject. Another notebook is dedicated to her grandmother's arrival from Russia. She even created a special series on pasta, a favorite food she learned to cook during the lockdown. These macaroni are talking to each other, and here is some person who wants to eat them, and they have no idea what's coming. At the beginning of the pandemic, Nadia started online comic drawing classes that have turned into a serious hobby. The young artist is even earning a little from her art. Together with her mom, she decides which topic to cover and how to present it in each session. Sushkova says all the planning and practice are paying off. She's making her own comic world deeper and more intricate. She's broadening her arsenal of ideas and tools that she uses to convey her thoughts and emotions. The faces of her characters are getting more detailed. She pays close attention to mimics. She's developing her own style, making it more nuanced. Nadia marked the start of the quarantine with a comic about the coronavirus that arrives on Earth from Mars and dinosaurs scatter away to stay safe. Today, a year later, she's focusing on a new superhero. I started drawing a comic about a superhero named Vaccine, who is fighting against the coronavirus. Here he is showing everyone how cool he is. In Nadia's imaginary world, Vaccine tracks down the coronavirus and gets rid of it once and for all. And by doing so, he frees the world and lets Nadia see her friends again in person. Jenny Adulu for VOA News, Boston. In our sports news, Kenya's Ruth Chepnitich smashed the world half marathon record on Sunday, clocking a time of one hour, four minutes and two seconds at the Ankale Istanbul half marathon. She shaved 29 seconds off the previous mark. The 26-year-old, a winner in 2017 and 2019, sprinted away from Ethiopia's Yalemzarf Yahualo across the final stages of the race to win by 38 seconds. Kenyan Helen Obiri, a two-time World 5000 meters champion, finished third in one hour, four minutes and 51 seconds, the fastest debut half marathon in history. The race marked the first time three women had finished inside 65 minutes in one half marathon. Kibi Watkandie of Kenya won the men's race in 59 minutes and 35 seconds. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.